Hey everybody, last week we had Tyler Kinley from Sockeye fame join us on the live stream. We chatted for about an hour and a half on a variety of different topics. If you want to see the full interview, then it's available now on Patreon. In these clips, we're talking about poaching off deep on like the far cutter in horizontal stack, for example, basically being more useful on defense, going outside of that one-to-one marking mentality. And we delve into then how the offense could potentially punish that and how the rest of the defenders need to react to support such a move, either with a cascade of switches or um, Japan style, where you leave the disc unmarked for a while. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Tune into the live streams every Wednesday on twitch.tv slash Ultimate. And if you want to see the full interview where we talk about a range of different stuff, then find it on Patreon. Enjoy. I'm watching the defense and I just get annoyed when people take positions that just to me that don't make sense so for instance you look at the screen here and number 13 at the bottom you know i don't know who that is but he's guarding number 17 at the bottom left and you see where the disc is coming in i mean you don't need to be close to the guy like i a lot of times i'll teach defense from a position of okay let's everyone just stop uh and then i'll talk through if number 17 at the bottom left of the screen if if he's standing there, what throws have to be thrown in order to get him the disc where he is, right? And in this case, it's going to be like a huge outside-in loopy backhand or, or, or forehand around the mark that has to go over a number of players or uh, like a kind of a zinger of a hammer uh, or like an incredibly dangerous uh, IO backhand, you know, past dump defenders that might be sagging i mean he's just not a threat and if you guard him as if he's a threat you're saying i'm going to take away one of those throws all of which if you're a coach you're probably hoping that they try to throw yeah so with that in mind there's no reason to be to to take away those threats because you would prefer them off off of this stop play to try to throw it to him i mean it's, it's it's just a low percentage high risk throw yeah so that line, there's no reason to guard him close. And therefore, look at the other players. You have Joe White in the middle of the field, who is just a dominant downfield threat. Uh, he's in a position that's really, really attackable. Um, and instead of guarding your person who's not a threat, why not go at least provide potential help there while still you know, being able to recover really easily? When you see what the play is as well, it's a very basic play. I mean, you just have Joe and the top right uh, machine player clear, and number 17, the bottom left, just runs across. And the fact that he gets open is just, from a defensive standpoint, you know, frustrating. It's like, mm-hmm. obviously, that's the only place he could go. Mm-hmm. Go go defend that. So that's that's the kind of stuff that, you know, it to me, it's the things that are obvious that in any scheme – make sense or in this case don't make sense in terms of positioning does that make sense yeah yeah well, totally um <clears throat> yeah if he moves across then then 23 can can go and take the under and um it's it's it's, it's just difference between using team play on defense and just having this one-to-one kind of thing and I, and I can't help but feel like maybe i'm reading too much into it i can't help but feel that the one-to-one thing is is like this macho thing you know it's kind of like i have my match up and i'm gonna like just beat this one match up you know and if my other teammates get beaten right that's not my problem um it's almost like well, i want to just add one clarification though in this case i'm not necessarily advocating for uh, 13 to drop back and 23 to switch on to 17. I'm saying that 13 can help yeah. and recover and come back and just take their take number 17. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the it's the help defense yeah. stuff from from uh, it, Lou Burris, isn't it? Being in a position to be able to do more and affect more rather than where he is now, where if Joe goes deep, he probably isn't catching up to yeah. provide any help over top. Um, and if you go to like the next image, you'll see what happens. I mean, yeah, this one. You just get. I mean, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm looking at it like, come on, you're. The fact that he was so close, laterally on the field, means he just got beat under for just just no reason. It's just so frustrating. Yeah, yeah. And and if they had, if they had just been front and back and Joe White, then then obviously the other defender could have 
been in just the position to take that under okay. um if, if they're yeah. happy to switch like you know if they're happy to switch then then it, it would have been like super efficient um and even if they're yeah. not happy to switch then he could have helped out for a while and then and then committed to the under this is one where uh, you know i'm sort of happier with people's positioning like you can see where the disc is it's sort of in the the upper left ish area right there um there, yeah, like that, the distance that that the machine defender is from his uh, from his player, yeah, that's what to me starts making more sense because the person he's defending is just so so far outside of the play that it's just not worthwhile guarding them as close as like the bottom right number three is on number ten at the bottom right of the screen. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Uh, disagree with you know that it's it's it is i would still not be where he is oh he's fouling him yeah i don't really understand but the nice thing is and you'll see this like uh the player that i'm thanking like you can see where he's looking i mean his his body is open he's watching where the disc is and it's an easy way for him to check to see where his his player is so that he doesn't lose track of them but they have a long distance to run uh, for them to cover, for him to be able to consistently check in, and then for him to be able to consistently adjust. And you can tell, you know, the the player he's covering is is non not very mobile right now. He's not sprinting anywhere, um, and it's very clear the other players that are in the throwing lane in front of the thrower they're active, and so they're the ones they're the options. They're, that's who. That's who you have to be defending right now, and so I really like that positioning. Um, and I think later on, I, I did another little series of like somebody is playing super far off, and they end up getting like a, a help block because they did not follow their person. They literally just recognized that their person's coming under, running into nothing. Here it yeah. is. This is a, this is the series yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. Let me just try and load it again. Yeah, so like you see number 26 who's being guarded by the other guy at the end of the yellow line. Like um, he's basically sort of playing this in 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 football and soccer, American football or American football, not soccer. We we would call this like a free safety where you're you're way back, you're defending all the biggest deep space, um, but everything in the field is in front of you. So you're, he's able to look at the disc and also see the player he's guarding uh, while still being able to provide help if a deep throw goes up. So if you move forward, I mean, his player comes under, but just by watching the natural progression of the play, he can recognize his player's coming under into a position where if that, if that throw goes up, its secondary throw is going to gain a little bit of yards, but it's not the primary threat. And in this case, the primary threat is in the top of the screen on the far side of the field going deep. And he, I'm sure he saw, as the play developed, um, the defender who's on that primary cutter really sold out to try to, to stop the underneath, which would open up, therefore, a huck. And if, as a smart defender, I think it's Peter Graffy, he's already thinking, okay, well, I can see he's taking away the under. That could potentially open up the deep. There could be a shot deep because of it. So I'm going to actually peel off knowing that if the thrower does want to throw that and maybe doesn't see me, I may be able to make a play. Mm -hmm. All of this is very basic. You know, when you, when you watch it on film, it's like, oh, yeah. Uh, I'm sure a lot of players, even maybe even listening right now, are like, "Yeah, obviously, like I would go do that." Yeah. But the challenge is, like, there are so many of these moments um, in the game, and it it can be hard to just. You always have to be thinking about this. Like in this case, I mean, you can see he's probably what 40 yards from his person, um, and you know you have to be willing to accept that if you do go give that help, and they don't throw it you then have to know what to do in terms of like, okay, well, my player is going to get it. I can't recover a mark in that time. And so what happens then? Do I have someone else switch on or do I come and stop the secondary throw and slowly reel in my mark? I mean, there's a lot of little little nuances yeah, here, he, but in this case, 
yeah go on that's, that's where it kind of gets interesting is like you know then then when you when you actually make it less of an individualistic move and more of a team defense thing because now that they've got this separation and all the other players in between them like there's no logical way that he should ever mark up against that other guy i mean not not like in the in the next few seconds um so then then it, when you start viewing it as a as a as more of a team game and you've got these players here right and and let's just discount this guy because i don't know where the his mark is and then you've got four defenders but you know this guy's gone okay but that that means there is extra help deep so then it's a case of how do the remaining three people mark those three people and and really like you don't want to be giving up this backwards throw to an absolutely unmarked player and so it makes sense for for him to actually go and mark there this guy to come across here um and then this guy to then maybe mark these two players um with the help of this guy here Something so like the you know i i think that there the challenge here is whether you've decided you're going to play a full team defense yeah, or yeah. you are going to allow some people to play uh a little bit uh looser and some people to stay honest in this case you know you said you're okay or like it's a dangerous pass to give away the one uh, to the to the side of the field but um realistically if the disc moves to that other side of the field it gained very little upfield yardage and what you need to do is stop the next throw the only thing that makes it dangerous is if the person who received it unmarked actually has anyone to throw to so a lot of times i see people sprint on to put a mark on but a mark if if you run to apply a mark and leave someone open downfield because of it it's incredibly hard for a mark to actually stop a wide open man downfield from being thrown to i mean there's however many million opportunities of different throws just to get it to an open guy so a lot of times what i would suggest in this case would be if that throw goes off it really doesn't do much this is what japan does really well is that they don't really care if a lateral throw occurs what they do is when the lateral throw as soon as it's in the air in the time span that the disc is in the air, it can only go one place. And so while the disc is being thrown and, and traveling from person A to receiver B, they don't go put a mark on receiver B. They sprint to take away the next receiver who would receive a pass from receiver B, mm. let's say C, D, or E. So in this case, that throw goes up, and the only reason it's actually dangerous is because it can then go to someone else downfield. So the remaining players, they don't actually, a mark is only useful if the rest of the downfield is guarded. Um, and if it's not, then if there's no one on the mark, but everyone else downfield is covered, the mark, the, the thrower still can't do anything. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, I mean, they're not allowed to run with the disc. It's his basic rule. <laughs> you got, yeah. So a lot of times I'll see people, you know, especially on pulls, Japan will do this. This is something I would try to teach teams to do is if they center to someone, applying a mark to someone who is receiving a centering pass, that person is probably their absolute best thrower, whether it's hucks, breaks, or whatever. A lot of throwers will tell you a mark can't stop me from doing what I want to do. But teams like Japan will not mark the thrower and they will double team the primary cutter which is super weird for an offense for one it, it's like kind of chaotic like offenses are used to having like everyone gets a gets a mark everyone sees this and japan will actually just double team the first cut it if the if the primary cutter has two defenders on him it's very weird as a thrower to have no mark and be looking at a guy double covered yeah so a lot of times they will like it's an added element of chaos you don't really know what to do and the rest of the offense is also kind of confused because usually they're like wait okay so he's double covered so should i cut now like who, who's next like what what's our move here because that's weird and so you know this it just sort of reminds me of what we're looking at here is if that throw do did go to the open guy but everyone else just stayed on their people downfield stopped that secondary pass that makes that sort of negates the advantage you get from that 
that that swing pass and it allows you to stop or take away a huck um by double covering it does that make sense totally yeah 100 percent. i love it um <clears throat> yeah it's re- that's really good to kind of think about i think quite often i'm i'm more of a <clears throat> i'm too much of a like a perfectionist in terms of like you know everyone should be covered and so if you're going to do it as a team this is the way you can do it um but yeah you're totally right like uh i think i was thinking if he gets the disc then you know he he because he has no mark he'll be able to to like throw and run and get the disc back and and kind of begin flow um but if it's actually a team decision to be like, well, that guy's in so much space at the moment and, and we're in a bit of disarray, let's just let that pass go over there. And as soon as it's in the air, just to have some kind of communication, which means that, you know, the disc is going to be there for a while because we're going to clamp down on everyone else. We're not going to have a spare defender just jogging towards the disc or whatever. It's going to be double coverage for a few seconds on, on whoever makes the next move. Um, yeah. And I, and I, I think on a, in, a, in a bigger way, I think that kind of defense... Um, you know, is is going to force offense to change. It's going to force offense to be more dynamic. It's going to force offense to treat people more equally on the field, so that so that everybody has equal opportunity to kind of get involved at different times, rather than being like, well, our number one cutter's not free, so not does number two cutter go now? Like that, you can get to the point where that kind of level of structure and organization um, is actually can be used as leverage against you by the defense. Yeah, I mean, that that was basically Sakai's approach to Revolver is that we didn't, didn't have necessarily the one-on-one people that could cover, you know, their downfield cutters um, or mark their their throwers. But what we did is we just tried to add chaos and make things weird and muddy. Okay, we're going to break it off there for this video, even though the conversation continues to develop. Uh, we talk about loads of interesting stuff. Um, outside of Frisbee, we talk about U.S. politics and a bit of covid um, and then in Frisbee, we're talking about Johnny Bansfield, uh, his approach to defense. Uh, we talk about the, the challenges involved in um, teaching players to switch and to surround um, and whether it might actually be more difficult for experienced players who are you know, very used to one to one to actually then switch into a, a switching mentality um, and the ease at which maybe it can be taught at a fundamental level when players um, begin playing. We also touch on kind of bigger picture things such as um, more experienced players who've been playing for maybe 20 years, starting to see the game in a different way. But then the transition from from like knowing that stuff to then teaching that stuff is very big and normally comes at the time when people start to have kids. Uh, And so there's a lot of kind of lost knowledge as people get kind of drawn away from the game or are just unable to kind of like break into the mold of, of that coaching environment. If you want to see the full interview where we talk about all that stuff, uh, in more detail it's about an hour and a half long and it's on patreon the link should be up there um just for a token of your appreciation um i hope you enjoyed this excerpt and i'll see you again soon